But Gail, how about that Deegan win? Oh man, it was <laughs> sweet. I'm so happy for them. Oh, I know. Okay, well, we'll uh, welcome everyone and call the meeting to order. And there is a virtual meeting statement to be read, if someone could read that for us. Hey, good morning. Due to the governor's recent order, all members of the Citizen Bond Oversight Committee are participating virtually. For virtual meetings, committee members will be muted until asked to be heard. At that time, they will be recognized and unmuted. When there is a vote, it will be necessary to take a roll call vote. A committee member will be recognized and will raise their hand and state their vote. Today's meeting is a public meeting. Per the notice, citizens can listen to the meeting if they contact the city manager's office to make necessary arrangements. The meeting also will be live streamed on the city's YouTube channel, which can be accessed at www.cityofws.org 2682 slash video. A recording of today's meeting will be available by next Tuesday at the city's website. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next item is the roll call. And do one of you have a list I obviously can see the people who are here, but the ones who are not. So could we go ahead and do the roll call? I can do that. Uh, Mark Dunnigan is absent. Gail Anderson. Here. Brian Heelan. Here. Melissa Vickers. Here. Paul Ford. Brenda Diggs. Here. Daisy Rodriguez. Bill Hayes. And Mabel Stevenson. So we currently have um, four members present. We need five to have a quorum. So I would recommend um, waiting to do minutes um, either until the end or until next meeting. Okay. All right, then we'll proceed to the projects, project updates. Okay. Let me share my screen. I'll pull up that full presentation. Okay. Can you all see the slide that's up there? Yes. Okay, great. Let me close that. There we go. All right. So um, the first update is um, on Bellevue Recreation Center replacement. Um, and I'm going to turn this over to uh, Robert Prestwood um, and um, to lead this one. Um, and then if William or Tasha want to jump in, they are welcome to. Robert is our city engineer. William is uh, the director of recreation. And Tasha Logan Ford is the um, assistant city manager who's over recreation, cent recreation and recreation centers. Morning, everybody. Morning. Um, yes, we had uh, started work on the Bellevue Recreation Center and had a preliminary design done. Um, and a preliminary estimate to go along with that. Um, we sat down with the council member of the ward to go over that estimate and design, and he expressed some, uh, some concerns with, uh, he wanted a little more emphasis put on the gym. Um, his feeling was he, he only had one chance to, to do the gym correctly. Um, so we uh, went back and got some uh, estimates done on changing the design to uh, what he was asking for, uh, came up with a estimate of $4 million. So um, council has approved an additional million dollars. We, we originally had 3 million in funding for this. So we now have 4 million in funding. Uh, you can see on the screen where uh, the funding is coming from. The additional uh, funding was 500,000 additional from economic development and 500,000 from the park acquisition bond fund. So we have now uh, met with the architect and he is currently revising the design to match what we've asked him to do. Um, we're expecting that probably to take another three to four months to uh, get the uh, design completed so we could go out to bid. Uh, 
and what what Heather has shown up here is um, it's kind of a combination of what the original layout was and what we're going to. Um, the original layout was a uh, where the cross hatching is was that smaller footprint for the gym, and then there was an addition going on the back of the building for the sore space. That sore space has been eliminated, and we're converting the inside of the existing recreation center to more of a multi use area. There's going to be a sore office and workspace in there. Um, and then you can see from the gym that uh, the footprint is expanding quite a bit. We're not going to be putting in bleachers now, but there will be space for bleachers in the future. And then there's also a walking track that's going around the basketball court. That was a feature when we had a community meeting out there uh, quite a few of the citizens were really interested in having some kind of walking facility indoors when the when the weather was bad um, and then we're also planning on which it was it was an alternate but that um, the covered basketball court that's there now um, we're gonna put up some type of um, outdoor wall or fencing around it so that um, things like the uh, woodworking tools and stuff like that can be left out there and, and are secure um, for the SOAR uh, participants. Okay. Um, we also sent some documents that relate to um, this project, if I can get this to toggle. Okay. Um, can you guys see the council action request form? Okay, mm -hmm. so this was emailed to you. Does anyone have any questions about the council action request form or the budget amendment portion of this? None. Okay, any other questions about Bellevue for Robert? How did SOAR take it? I mean, is SOAR's needs, are they still being met? Uh, they are being met, um, it's just, more of a shared space where um, some of their equipment will have to be put away um, at the end of the day uh, instead of just being able to leave it out and and just come back in in the morning and it's it's right where they want it so it there'll be a little more effort to use the shared space but they they still have what they need okay mm-hmm mm -hmm. So next up, we have our public safety bond projects. Um, Robert is also going to be presenting these. Um, so we'll just keep going through. Feel free to ask questions as they come up. I uh, actually may have to lean on yeah. Ben for that <laughs> one. <laughs> ben has the first one. I apologize. That's um, me. Yep. Sorry. So, uh, yes, this is one of the, the, the larger items in the uh, 2018 bond package. Uh, this is a replacement of the city county public safety radio communications system, uh, $9 million, which actually is the city's share of the cost. So the, actually the total cost of the project is estimated uh, to be at $18 million. Uh, this is gonna focus on, you know, the bulk of the, of the cost is gonna come from what I'm, what I'm calling, you know, replacing the brains of the system. Uh, uh, and so uh, really the, the consoles, the, 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 IT infrastructure uh, of the system. And then uh, we'll also be replacing the radios so that they'll have uh, you know, upgraded radios to use you know, for countywide coverage. Right now, uh, based on the work of the consultant that the county has hired to do the design and really kind of shepherd the project through to completion, uh, we're not looking at adding any new towers uh, in the county. So we're, we're looking at using the, the towers that were constructed back in the early 2000s when uh, this project uh, was first approved in, a, in the 2000 bond referendum, believe it or not. Um, and so uh, as, as Heather notes here in the slide that uh, the design is complete. The uh, consultants have uh, developed the RFP document for, uh, for bidding out the purchase of the equipment, the installation of the equipment, you know, basically getting the, 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 the new system in place. Uh, the current, you know, plan is for those proposals to come in sometime in the late spring, early summer, and then for the county to award the contract uh, at that time and probably start the start that phase of the project in July. And then it's estimated that, that it'll take 18 months from contract award to complete it. So we're looking at probably January of 2023 to have the new system uh, in place. 
And what are the upgrading features? I mean, what, what's going to make it a better system? Is it is it coverage? Is it clarity? Is it? Well, I think that, and I and I can I'll be happy to give uh, provide more details on exactly uh, what that's involving. I mean, the, the coverage was certainly looked at as part of the the uh, the uh, consultants. Uh, work on the design uh, so to make sure that if we have any coverage you know, gaps in the county that those are addressed with the new system. We have, we have a system right now that's probably you know, at the end of life in terms of uh, being able to find you know, parts you know, for maintenance, that type of thing. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really trying to look towards, you know, I, would, I would say probably like the next generation system. Uh, but, but Brian, I'd be happy to give you know provide more details as, as far as uh, you know what we're what we're looking at. I, I think that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, as, as I recall, when we put this item on the the bond issue uh, for the voters, it was primarily that they couldn't find parts to right. you know up to replace the existing system. So I'm just hoping we can hang on till January 2023. <laughs> right. That, that's that's correct. And how old is the current system that we're using now? So, you know, the, the current system was, uh, was, you know, built out in the early 2000s. It was part of uh, the city as part of their bond referendum in 2000, included an investment for a new system. And we partnered with the county on that. And, and, and that involves constructing some new towers to increase coverage, you know, throughout the county. So you're looking at, you know, a system that's two decades old. And what's the expected lifespan, life cycle for this new system? Are we expecting 12, 15 years again or longer? I, be I believe so, Brian, but I, I, I need to verify that with, with the county. The county uh, interagency communications office is actually the, the point department on this. And so, uh, so I'll, I'll reach out to them. But yeah, I mean, I, I would say that at least, you know, a, a useful life of that. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the public safety training complex. Um, what this is, is basically a very large um, concrete pad that allows the police department to um, set up different courses using cones to uh, train their drivers and, and renew their driver's skills. Um, we've had quite a bit of difficulty finding an appropriate site for this project. Um, took us quite a while. We thought we had located one um, up near Rural Hall. Um, it's right beside 52 where the uh, the Stanleyville exit is being reworked as part of the, the bypass right now. Um, had made an offer on it and right before we were closing on the property, Duke Power came in and said they needed to relocate their towers right on top of the piece of property that we were getting ready to pur purchase. <laughs> so um, they could not verify if the property would still suit our needs uh, once the towers are relocated. So we have waited for them to get that done, um, have just been in contact with them a couple weeks ago about it and have sent them the preliminary sketch of what we would like to do and are still waiting to hear back from Duke on whether um, whether it'll work and whether they will allow us to do it in the first place. Uh, if that falls through, then we're, we're back to starting from scratch looking for another piece of property. Is the, is the property privately owned? Does Duke Power own the property? Or? Um, Wisby, Winston-Salem, I can't remember what it is. It's the, the economic development group um, actually owns the property. It's part of a business park up there. Um, but Duke does own now the, obviously, the strip that their towers are in. Is this a large piece of property or? It's, it's a large piece of property and it has to be fairly flat too because the pad has to be at about a half percent, um, can't be more than a half percent incline anywhere. So we, we've got two constraints there. So the budget of 3.5, that's not just acquiring the property, that's upfitting it. Yes, the, the, the goal for this project would be to acquire the property, build the pad, and build a small classroom space and restroom there um, for the, when, they're, when they're holding classes for the, uh, for the driving. 
Okay. And you're you're anticipating an answer from Duke in in a fairly short time frame? Um. No, because it's Duke. Uh, sorry. Yeah, that's my concern. <laughs> that's, my concern. <laughs> that's my concern, exactly. <laughs> I, no, I, we're, we hope we will know something in the next few weeks. Okay. Um, fire station number three, uh, which is the fire station over near the airport. Um, a re complete replacement for that fire station out there. Uh, <clears throat> we basically have the design um, right at, ready to go out to bid. Uh, we had a little bit of a delay on this one because we brought in the preliminary estimate um, and it was right at budget. So we decided to wait. We, we had fire station 13 out to bid at that time. So we decided to wait and see um, what the prices looked like on that one. Um, before we put this fire station out to bid. Um, using the per square foot price that we got on fire station number 13, um, we felt like the, the budget on this one was adequate, so we are currently uh, getting ready to put this fire station out to bid. That's the one we visited, right, guys? It yeah. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, this is the site plan, um, which... Uh, trying to get, get oriented at the north is Liberty Street. Um, you can see the footprint of the existing fire station there to the right. So this has been designed so that station stays in operation uh, throughout construction of this one. And then once they move into this new station, the old building will be, be torn down. And how long is the bid process expected to take? Bid process for us is usually um, at least three months. Um, it's sometimes can drag out to even four months because there, there's quite a few steps that have to be, be taken as far as advertising. And then um, it, once uh, the bids do come in, uh, if they don't meet the goals, they have to go through the good faith effort and then we have to get it on council agenda. So depending on where all that falls, as far as agenda deadlines, um, it could be three to four months. Okay. And these are some of the renderings. Um, the, the architect, uh, since we're over there near the airport, you'll notice it's it's supposed to, to look a little bit like an airport hangar, which is the, the curve there. Um, mm -hmm. the, the Community Appearance Commission really, really liked that extra little touch. So then I mentioned fire station 13. Um, this is a brand new station that we're building over near the Haynes Mall area. Um, the reason this one is being built uh, is the uh, the fire fire department has heat maps that show their response times, and they had a, a fairly large gap in their response time in that area. So this this station is being built to uh, cover that. Um, we have bid this project. Um, it, the bids did unfortunately come in over budget, so we are currently um, in process called value engineering, um, which means eliminating some features in the project uh, to get it under budget. Uh, we have those numbers back um, and need to brief the council member um, of that ward. Uh, if, if he's okay with what we're suggesting, then we will take it to council uh, for contract approval. And then again, here's, here's some renderings of this. Um, so it's a fairly large uh, complex because of the area it's covering. Uh, the, the fire department wanted the ability to be able to um, add crews or equipment as needed. How much of the budget did it come in? <clears throat> it came in right at budget, but our goal on all of these projects is to have a 10% contingency. So we're, we're cutting back so that we have uh, some money available that if anything comes up during construction, we'll be able to cover it. Robert, I'm sorry if I missed it, but where exactly is the new station going, going to be built? It's off of uh, Bethel Church Road, which is um, off of uh, Burke Mill Road, kind of back behind um, all those medical buildings and, and I guess where the, uh, the airline offices used to be there right off of uh, Haynes Mall Boulevard. Be familiar where I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's back there. It's actually a fantastic piece of property. The church back there had been holding on to it um, 
it's it's flat and it's not a landfill which it seems like every piece of property we find anymore is a former landfill so all right um are there any final questions about any of the public safety projects Okay, um, then we'll move on to our recreation bonds. Um, Robert and William and Tasha, if she needs to, will kind of be tag teaming these ones. Um, so I'll just keep scrolling through and let folks kind of lead as they need to. Uh, good morning. Um, the Parkland acquisition uh, development uh, geo bond money um, uh, originally was uh, uh, Establish has a million dollars, and this project was to create a reserve fund for parkland acquisition, uh, future parkland, and open space. Um, the commitments that we have to date uh, we've purchased um, uh, a piece of property off of Conoke Drive, which is right now considered to be open space. Um, there's a piece of property off of near Meredith, Meredith Woods, uh, again, that is uh, also undeveloped. There was a $100,000. Uh, donation to the Crossroad Land Conservancy uh, earlier, um, early last year. Um, and then uh, as Robert mentioned earlier, uh, there was a $500,000 uh, commitment um, to raise the additional money to complete the Bellevue Recreation Center. Um, as of right now, we have $342,790 remaining in that account um, that has not been um, allocated for any particular purpose. Um, and that's where we are uh, with the parkland acquisition uh, slash development money to date. Uh, can you tell us sort of the process that you use to determine where to purchase properties? Um, typically, the, uh, those requests come from um, city council. Um, and after we, uh, we work with our real estate division, um, and once we uh, kind of do our due diligence in terms of environmental um, look at the environmental impacts of the property. We do soil testing. Um, and we, with, once we we obtain that information, we provide it to the council member. They make a determination whether or not they want to move forward okay. with the purchase. So there's no um, person on staff that's looking for available land. Well, uh, me and my staff, uh, we typically look at the needs across the community. Um, we had a. Uh, the park and open space master plan, which was completed last year, um, kind of provided some direction in terms of where some of the needs are in terms of new park land uh, or where new parks uh, could, should be developed. Uh, so it's used as a guide to drive those uh, drive those decisions. And then the funding that which is available now for the 2018 geo bonds are used to um, make those purchases. Yeah. Well, I, I asked because you said that it comes from the council, so. Yeah, the, the, the ultimate decision um, to look at those particular areas or particular uh, pieces of property or parcels of property um, come from, uh, usually those recommendations come from city council, but the parks and open space, what's the, what's the say the Forsyth County parks and open space plan is used as a guide to drive those decisions as well. Are there any, excuse me, are there any significant areas right now that you're, that you all are focusing on that you feel are, you know, significantly underserved compared to other areas in the city? Ms. Anderson, as Mr. Royston um, briefly mentioned in the parks open space plan that was completed, that looks at where we have potential gaps in our system in both the city and the county. And one area that they did identify as having um, a service gap was a newly annexed area that's off of Union Cross. And that being an area where we need to consider the acquisition of property moving forward. So we do have um, a staff work group that is being led by a real estate team that is looking for property in that area. There are some highway projects that are taking place. So we're also thinking about um, land that may become available as that part of that project that could serve as a, a park site for us. Um, but a lot of the focus in that open space plan was actually on um, existing parks, existing mm -hmm. centers, and making sure that we're doing enough to protect those amenities and also enhancements. But there was um, not a large need identified other than what was seen in that Union Cross area of town. Thank you. Has, has Cross North received the funding it needs to protect that property from, from different agencies and groups? 
Yeah, so I believe that they've they've obtained um, they were able to to meet the goal, their fundraising goal to protect that piece of property. Thank you. Uh, Bethania <clears throat> Roll Hall Park Project, and Robert, feel free to jump in on this one. Um, we have there was a uh, request from from the community to construct a small neighborhood park uh, uh, near the Bethania Row Hall area. Um, once we looked at that particular uh, that area of town, we found that uh, fire station, at least fire station twenty, uh, there was an additional piece of land of city owned land that could be used to help develop um, a park. Uh, we partnered with the the fire fire department. It was one of our um, only fire stations that did not have a complete loop so that the uh, fire station 20, that once the trucks were returning from a call, we actually have to back into the fire station. As part of the improvements um, with this project, um, we're gonna complete that that uh, that loop so, fire, so that the fire trucks can come in and circle in to the fire station. Uh, there will be a small picnic shelter um, so I believe there's a restroom and there's some walking space there for the community to use there uh, on that particular project. Uh, uh, William, if you want, <clears throat> one thing I did want to point out is that this project is actually under construction. Um, they're, they're currently uh, doing some work with rerouting. Um, unfortunately, that fire station is still on septic tank. There's not uh, not a sewer line out there yet. So we're having to relocate uh, some of the septic lines. Basically, they're located where the new parking lot is gonna be uh, located down there. But this is a site plan of, of the actual pocket park. And you can see the, uh, the addition of the driveway coming out the back of the station there too. So they no longer will have to back in. So it's really much more of a shelter area versus a walking, you know, a large walking track to land or anything like that. That, that is correct. Um, one of the um, things the council member wanted to have the ability to do, it, it is a shelter area, but um, she w wanted it to be able to have a uh, small farmer's market um, in that shelter, like on Saturday mornings. So uh, it's kind of a multi-use area for that. And again, Robert, where is Station 20? It's um, off of uh, Bethania Roll Hall Road, um, kind of behind the uh, Long Creek Golf Course, mm -hmm. where it fronts along Bethania Roll Hall Road. Okay. Robert, you want to take this one as well? Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, again, uh, this uh, area of town um, known as Georgetown, um, which is uh, off of, north off of uh, Rinalda Road. Um, there was a desire for a pocket park in that neighborhood. Um, it's, it's taken us a little while to identify some property for it, but uh, we have identified a piece of property, um, have had a consultant uh, lay out a preliminary design with a, a playground and some benches um, and a little bit of a walking path and, and parking. So uh, we are currently doing due diligence on that property. Um, the environmental reports have come back uh, good, so we're not concerned about that. And so the uh, the next step for this one is to have a public input meeting in the community itself to, uh, to see what their feelings are on this. Robert, out of the $800,000 budget, what, what's what's land acquisition part of it? What, what part of it is land acquisition? Hey, it's very small. Um, William, do you remember, if I've, I'm thinking it's $27,000. Yes, yeah, it's a little over 25000 yes. Yeah. Right, so it should it should be a nice facility when it's done. It, yes. Yes. Is that on the right side of Renolda? It is. Yes, yes ma'am. Because yeah, it's kind of flat land, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. There, it's a it's an interesting uh, neighborhood because there's some a lot of older homes there, but then at the back of the neighborhood, there's been quite a bit of new development yeah. um, added on to it. So um, there, there's a des desire for some outdoor space. Yeah. 
this was this is the preliminary uh, design that uh, was laid out on that piece of property. So as you can see, it's it's a fairly simple park, but um, with you know a restroom, playground, and a, and a small gazebo, uh, just so the the neighborhood has something local that they can walk to if they want to or drive over to. Um, also, as part of our 2018 GEO bonds, um, there was funding um, allocated, a uh, total of $970,000 that was allocated to um, either repair or replace um, HVAC, electrical lighting systems, painting, interior finishes uh, in a lot of our recreation centers across the city. Um, many of our recreation centers were built um, in the 80s, 70s, 80s. Um, and some of the mechanical systems within those facilities have, have outlived their, uh, their lifespan. And so our, our property and facilities management division is working and managing these individual pro uh, projects. Um, out of that 970,000, 690,570 has been spent to date uh, with remaining of $279,430. Um, and that, that covers a multitude of different areas of, of projects across uh, far our recreation centers across the city. Um, the next slide um, breaks down um, where those particular uh, projects are. Um, uh, they start at uh, Winston Lake Golf Course. It also includes picnic shelter and pavilion uh, restroom and roof, roof replacements. Um, there, are, there are lighting projects, uh, HVAC replacement. Uh, at our Martin Luther King Recreation Center, there's an asbestos tile abatement and replacement. Um, as well as Grace Court, there's a there's a project to repair some of the rotten wood um, there at Grace Court, so we can maintain that facility for um, rentals and weddings um, and and so forth. Are there any questions about these particular um, projects for facility renewal? Well, just because Coach Hayes is absent, I just want to ask if Winston Lake, if the whole Winston Lake project, which I think there were some people who kind of thought maybe there was going to be a greater emphasis on it. I mean, has, has the community bought into whatever's being done with only a roof replacement over there? Well, the roof replacement on the, um, on the clubhouse, um, on the pro shop at the clubhouse, uh, has been, has been completed there. We've had some issues with the HVAC there, uh, especially during some of the warmer months during the summer. Uh, so the funding was identified to address that. And so uh, we found that the golfers and the, the users of that facility are very happy about that. Uh, overall, uh, we found that all of the, after all of the investments that have been made at Winston Lake Golf Course, it's been a much nicer facility. Uh, we updated the car paths. We replaced the greens uh, several years ago. Um, we're going to be making, as part of the Winston Lake Park Phase 2 project, we're going to be making some improvements to the driving range. Um, and so it's a it's an ongoing process, but uh, uh, we're getting positive feedback from the users of that of that golf course. Great. What is the in, I mean? What's the time frame for the remaining projects to kind of become in progress? Um, I'll have to get those actual um, the the statuses of those projects. Uh, the ones that are in progress are either they're either in the design phase or ready to go to bid. Um, some of the other projects, uh, I have to get the updates from uh, property facilities management, but we can get those uh, together so she can provide it to the members of the committee. Yeah. That'd be great information if we could get it, thanks. Yeah, just yeah as I looked at the, the recreation projects as a whole, so many of them are behind schedule. And to me, these are projects that the community interacts with more so than a lot of the other ones. So I'm hoping that if there are expectations out there in the community about when some things might be done, that we are communicating, you know, the status and why things may be a little bit behind and, and the projected um, completion dates for these, because these were the areas when we were doing the bond referendum where we had a lot of concern from citizens. I understand, and, and point, point taken and noted, and uh, we can provide an update for those projects that are behind. Um, and get that to uh, Heather so she can provide that to the committee as well. Has, has COVID-19 added to the delay? It's, it's a, COVID has affected projects across the city, not just recreation projects, but projects yeah, across the city. Um, many of our consultants uh, have work from home schedules just like the city does. Um, 
there have been some delays, but you know, as we progress through COVID, um, we've gotten creative as well as our consultants have gotten creative in terms of getting products uh, moving again and getting them back on schedule, but it has impacted us to, to a degree. Uh, when you um, when we get to the review of the stoplight report, um, you'll see on some of the explanations some areas where COVID either among city staff or our design staff or other consultants have, have definitely impacted some of those schedules. Yeah, I, I just think communication to the public is, is so important. Um, you know, as we as these things happen, people are understanding when they know what's going on. It's that what we've seen in the past is it's that sort of lack of information or maybe they don't access the information that we give them that creates a lot of the concerns in the community. The council, the council persons for all these different areas, I mean, they, they get, they're getting this information constantly, right, Heather? Um, they are getting updates. Um, I know that, um, you know, staff works to keep their assistant city managers informed of different progress who then talks, then, then the ACMs and the city manager are in constant communication with council. Um, ben or Tasha could speak a little bit more specifically about how that um, sort of information sharing process works with council if you'd like. Sure. Heather, you've accurately captured um, how we communicate um, the status of projects with elected officials. Part of this too um, also relates to some of the projects um, as we have gotten into design and then we have meetings with community. Um, at times we, we get a, a slight change in the scope which can create delays. And for several of the projects, um, as Mr. Presswood was going through his comments, um, if there's some you know, redesign or if they're coming in over bid and we have to take them back out um, to, to rebid, that can also create de delays. So there can be um, a number of factors, but we do make sure that that information is communicated to the council member um, of the ward that um, it's relayed to, to the public as, as best we can when there are delays, but there's always room for us to improve that. So if there are suggestions that are coming um, from this community, Heather shares that with us as well. Uh, we had several, uh, uh, several projects or several sites that uh, we felt are money uh, revenue generating areas for us, uh, such as a Sarah Lee soccer complex, a high soccer complex, as well as a lighting project there at the Little Creek Recreation Center. Um, this particular project is under construction. Uh, it's anticipated to be complete um, uh, late May of 2021. Um, and we have several fields that uh, will allow us by lighting them to uh, provide, to gain rental revenue um, in the evenings, whereas before this project, before the lights were installed, we would not have that ability. Um, as part of these, these lighting projects, uh, we also look at ease of operating them. Um, all of these lighting projects also come with, the lights themselves come with a 25-year um, warranty, um, and our staff are able to control the lights, turn them on and off, and manage the system remotely. Uh, they do not have to be on site to manage these systems. Uh, and on the next slide, you will see the actual field locations um, where we will be installing the lights. Um, so on the left side, uh, many of the fields, which are the primary fields that are used there at Sarah Lee Soccer Complex, uh, those are the fields uh, that will be lit. And the yellow dots actually indicate the actual pole locations for those lights. Um, at Little Creek, uh, we have a large open field that we're gonna begin to maintain um, as uh, as a, a playable field, um, even in the evenings. And so we're gonna uh, provide lighting for that particular uh, park as well. As well as this, uh, the high soccer complex, we're gonna light um, two of the fields, two of the fields there, uh, so that those fields can be used in the evening. Uh, we can rent them in the evening and be able to gain additional revenue for rentals uh, for those park locations. Um, recreation facility renewal, the security improvements. Um, believe it or not, uh, up until uh, there was funding actually allocated for this, these particular projects, um, at our 17 recreation centers and many of our, many other of our remote um, recreation recreational sites, we did not have adequate um, security at those facilities. Um, as part of the, the 2018 geo bonds, we're adding uh, security systems to all of our recreation centers. Um, 
that includes uh, remote cameras, uh, cameras that can be uh, accessed remotely um, to help better prosecute those who begin to vandalize those facilities, but also provides assistance security for staff and patrons that visit those facilities. Uh, we're working with our information systems uh, department to um, to get these locations installed. They manage the back end of the security uh, software and system for these uh, for these uh, projects, and so we're working with them. Uh, we have completed uh, 14th Street Haynes Holdry and the MLK Recreation Center, um, and they are working to get a project out to bid to solicit companies to. Uh, complete all of the remaining uh, recreation center locations. So the three that we have completed to date are 14th Street, Haynes Holdry, mm -hmm. and Little Creek. And consequently, um, after the uh, installation of the cameras there at 14th Street, we were actually able to use that system to um, find some missing items or find out who misplaced some items there at 14th Street. And so the systems are handy and they're desperately needed throughout our park system. Uh, William, I see where the two of them are over budget quite a bit. Are, are you confident that we have enough money there to do all the rest of the rec centers? Yes, ma'am. Those, those three centers were chosen because they were um, some of our larger recreation centers in our park system. So we, we knew that the cost may come in a little bit higher at those locations. Um, given some, some of our other recreation centers, such as like uh, the smaller ones like Rupert Bell and WC Sims, we don't think that those costs will come in nearly uh, close to uh, the budget or the estimated amount. So we, we feel confident in being able to complete all of our locations. Okay, thanks. And again, a schedule for the completion of these projects? Um, initially, our uh, IS department had planned to have the RFQ out um, before the end of December. Um, they're still uh, working to get that uh, that RFQ uh, prepared and out on the, out on the streets. Um, I have to. We can provide an update for uh, the remaining schedule the, for the schedule for the remaining sites. I can get that to Heather so she can provide that to the committee as well. Thank you. Um, uh, continuing on with recreation facility renewal projects, uh, we had several tennis court uh, tennis court repairs that needed to be made. Uh, over the years, we found that patching the courts um, with various methods only uh, put a Band-Aid on, on, on problems. Um, some of the three locations that we, uh, complete, we've completed uh, so far are Carver High School, 14th Street, and Middle Springs. Uh, Middle Springs was actually uh, one of those one of those locations as a as a textbook uh, case for we could not patch it anymore. We had actual base failure that was contributing to the cracks and deficiencies on the courts themselves, um, and so that particular court was torn down. The fencing was removed and it was torn down to its base and then rebuilt. Um, it repainted, striped, and had new poles and nets uh, installed. Uh, the courts at Carver and at 14th Street are actually on. Um, school system property, but because of an uh, agreement that was been in place for uh, many years, we maintain those courts uh, for public use and for the school system. All three of these projects are complete. And that was, uh, was it under budget, over budget, on budget? Uh, we were able to complete them all within budget, um, slightly under budget. Um, Always need and congratulations there. All right, thank you very, very much. We we, we have to get creative when we can, um, uh, but we were able to get those projects completed slightly, slightly under budget for uh, those tennis court locations. Um, currently, um, we just finished uh, executing the notice to proceed for, um, and have a contract to select it to replace um, sport court, which is a material that you would find in many of our recreation center gyms. Uh, we're going to replace that sport court with hardwood floors. Uh, as part of this project, we took and we're using, uh, we're, we're going to take this project as an opportunity to become a little bit more creative at various locations throughout our park system and our gyms to do some sort of uh, painted or uh, some painted designs or creative designs on the gym floors. Um, no, no two gym floors in our park system will look the same. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, that's the gym floor for the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Recreation Center. And so we felt it fitting to do a particular design on the floor that was fitting for that location. 
Uh, there are two gyms there at Miller Park. Both of those floors will be replaced with hardwood floors. The court on the lower right, that particular gym was named after, um, was named in honor of a former recreation employee that had a huge impact on the community there at uh, near Happy Hill, uh, Mr. Ben Pickett. Uh, so we were even able to work with our marketing department to get the likeness of his face, uh, the outline of his face on the floor with his signature. Um, and we, all of our gym floors will have very unique um, designs on them. And the, the floor on the upper right-hand corner is the, the design for Sprague Street. Uh, presented that design to uh, the council member of the ward. And we're still looking to, um, that won't be the final design. I'm still working with him to get a, get a design that he's comfortable with. Um, but again, you'll be able to visit uh, each one of our recreation center gyms and have a very, very different experience. Um, what we're also doing as part of this process, <clears throat> the gym floors will also be striped for pickleball, uh, which is a growing trend um, nationwide. And so we're going to use this as an opportunity as well to stripe all of our gym floors for pickleball so we can begin to host those programs indoors for our residents as well. I, for one, love the individualized look, but I mean, we're getting these individualized look under the original budget plan or is or Yes, they're all all under budget. Um, and what, what, that, what that would allow us to do is not just complete the gym floors, but um, our goal is to replace the backboards and rims with fiberglass backboards and rims so that when you walk into the gym, what you see in there are new items, new scoreboards, new backboards and rims, new stripes, new floors. Um, and so the, the floors themselves will last us 20 to 25 years uh, with reduced cost of maintenance. We can't really maintain the sport court floors as they are now. Um, um, they just out, outlive their use, but we think that this community as a whole will appreciate the hardwood floors versus the sport court. Was there input from the community about what what would design would be on the floors? No, we did not open that up for public input. Um, it was something extra that we added um, at the end. However, the the floor for Sprague, uh, I am working with the council member of the ward to do something that's fitting for the community. Uh, and that's the one at the top right. Yes, ma'am. I'm glad you're working on that. I that that <laughs> that yeah. really. I mean, you know, <laughs> that needs to change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're working. We're working to change that. We have some. I have some pretty cool ideas of what we can do. Um, yeah. And and for instance, at Miller Park, uh, the 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 other the second gym at Miller Park isn't shown on the diagrams. But some of the graphics on the floors, we'll be able to uh, creatively and artistically continue those patterns on the walls of the gyms uh, to make the entire gym area a much nicer experience. So that it's not just the gym floor itself. And we're going to try to do that. We're going to do the same thing uh, for the gym floor at Sprague. Um, we have some pretty good ideas, but I need to sit down with our team, uh, our marketing team, to get that diagram complete. Uh, and be able to share that with the council member of the ward. But I think that um, in the end, that, that floor design, the floor designs as a whole will be something that the community will appreciate. And we just use it, we found a way to uh, kind of creatively do something other than just putting hardwood down and then just doing the typical striping that you will find. I want to piggyback a little bit on what Gail was talking about earlier about communicating, making sure that this gets communicated to the public at large, because I think that this is something visually exciting um, that's really representative of the parks and recreation and something that the city's doing, you know, that I think adds value. It, it brings in that artistic flavor that speaks to the arts and innovation of our city. And I think that this is something that all of the constituents would be really excited to learn more about and know that it's happening. Um, even if they don't go into these centers themselves, um, I think it's something that everybody can take pride in. And I'm just curious as to how we're communicating and getting this information out because this is like the first time I'm hearing about it. Um, and I just think that a lot of people would be, you know, really excited to see that this is happening. I, I agree. Um, when, when we initially um, began this route, I started down this road with our gym floor replacements. Uh, I met with our marketing department director, uh, Ed, Ed, Ed McNeil. Yes. And he and I um, are working on a plan to showcase these courts once they're complete. 
Great. Um, but because the like these are concepts, uh, concept designs, the, the actual final floor designs may be a little <clears throat> bit more elaborate than what what's shown here. Uh, but we are working on a process to, in a way, to um, kind of show off, for lack of a better description, mm -hmm. of what we've been able to accomplish with our gym floors. And so there will be some sort of um, public announcement or something that kind of showcases what we're doing on our gym floors. Great. Um, as part of our uh, facility renewal uh, repairs, uh, there were four pools that needed to uh, be replastered. Uh, those pools were Bolton, Kimberly, Polo, and Reynolds. Um, Bolton, um, uh, Bolton, the, the replastering of Bolton is complete. Um, that project did come in over budget. Um, reason being, uh, once the contractor began the demolition on the plaster of the pool, uh, we were able to find a leak that created uh, uh, probably a two van size void hole underneath the plaster that needed to be repaired as part of the process. Uh, we've noticed that over the past, ever since I've been here with the city that, you know, it's been going on at least 15 years or more that we've been losing water um, at Bolton and we were able to, to determine that it was one of the return lines that was leaking. Um, those return lines have been um, abandoned. We installed new return lines um, and completed the, the replastering of the pool at Bolton. Uh, Polo, the pool at Polo is, um, is also complete. Uh, the, the Kimberly Park and Rose Park pools are actually under construction. Um, and we, after meeting with the council member for over Sprague, um, a, design, a decision was made to abandon the pool and replace that pool with a uh, with a splash pad. Uh, we feel that uh, the with the attendance that we've uh, been monitoring there at Sprague, uh, this will provide a, a much better opportunity for people to kind of come out and enjoy, um, have some sort of aquatic relief during some of the warmer months here in Winston Salem. When will it be ready, the Sprague Street? Sprague, uh, the drawings are uh, about 99% complete. We're looking, uh, our goal is to go to bid, uh, have that out to bid um, uh, in the month of February uh, with construction beginning um, soon thereafter. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, we wanted to do something that was a little bit different than what you would typically see at some of our splash pads across the city. Mm -hmm. uh, we're always trying to try to find ways to get creative and push the envelope in terms of what people can expect. And so we were finally able to kind of come up with a design and work with the manufacturer to um, give us some options, provide some options that will provide a very unique play, aquatic play opportunity there at Sprague. Uh, there were, COVID did create significant delays with um, many of the vendors that were available um, to provide this equipment to us. Uh, but we were finally able to get those questions answered and get uh, and be able to move forward with this project. We're looking to go to bid again in sometime in February. Great. Um, Old Town drainage improvements. Um, as you can see from the aerial photograph um, at the bottom of the screen, we have several uh, drainage issues um, there at Old Town. Uh, it impacted the tennis courts, it impacted the basketball courts, the, it impacts the picnic shelter um, itself there. Um, and what we found there's a large, the, the, the walking path that you see that's connected to the driveway entrance goes on the, the right side of the playground is uh, there has, there may be 15 to 20 feet of difference between the playground, the finished grade of the playground and that walking path. And during heavy storm events, uh, larger rain events, a lot of that washes down onto the, the lower areas where the picnic shelter, tennis courts, and basketball courts are. And so we've um, worked with um, our engineering department and Robert's fabulous team to come up with some options and some solutions to solve the drainage issues, some of the runoff and erosion issues we're having out there. Um, this project is out to bid, um, and we're looking to begin work um, sometime early spring. To, to make these improvements. Robert, you wanna take this one? I'll jump in there, yep. Um, Winston Lake Park, phase two. Um, 
this involves a, a new fishing pier at the lake itself, a new picnic shelter and restrooms um, and kind of a, a little bit of a boardwalk area on the lake shore. Um, this project is under construction. Uh, bids did come in under budget. Um, this project has two phases. Um, we're doing this initial part, and then once all of this is done, there's a second project that um, will study the dam out there at the lake and make repairs to that dam. So um, it was, we are under budget, but that money that, that we have is, is committed to that second part of this project. It's a rendering of the uh, the shelter that's going out there. We use the same architect that we did for the water park um, that's there on Waterworks Road. So they uh, use the same materials um, that they use for the building up there. So the, the park will have the same look throughout. And then the site plan of it, you can see the, the fishing pier down in the right corner and then the shelter is, is there at the pier. Um, and then there's, um, to the right, that's a raised area. Um, so they, we're gonna be improving the pass through there and there'll be some um, some t picnic benches and, and things like that at the top of the path uh, to just provide a, a good location to uh, to go out there if, if you're not fishing, give you some, somewhere else to go. Salem Lake, phase two. Um, this is to create a new picnic shelter where the playground is. Um, I believe recreation calls that area the point. William, am I right about that? <laughs> uh, building a new boathouse for kayaks out there, um, create additional parking and improve the boat launch area. Um, this project is under designed. It's basically done. Plans are in inspections, uh, going through the permitting process right now. So once we have um, all our permits in hand, we will be putting it out to bid. This is the the boathouse I mentioned. Um, the lower area is where the the actual boats will go. That top area is meant to be um, either a picnic area or um, classroom space or just, you know whatever they decide they want to use it for. Uh, again, we use the same architect that did the um, the building in the background there. So it's it will have a similar look to the, the new uh, marina that's out there now. Quarry Park phase two, um, the new playground shelters and, and paved parking out there. Uh, we have bid that project. Um, unfortunately, it has come in over budget. We have seen, and you, um, you've probably heard, have seen a huge price increase um, on steel lately. Uh, again, it's followed, I think, lumber. This hit lumber a few months ago, and now it's hitting steel. Um, supplies are in short supply right now, so uh, we're seeing it in prices. We're gonna look at value engineering. Um, we're kind of in the middle of that though, so I can't really can't really tell if we're gonna be able to get it under budget or not, um, because we then we'll have to meet with the council member and, and see where he wants to go with this. This is a rendering of the playground um, that we're hoping to build out there. Again, it's it's to match the look of the the overlook that was built out there in phase one, um, and, and then it's also supposed to look like a quarry itself, um, which is that area with the wall down there, and then that center area is supposed to to mimic the water that that's in the quarry. Just to look from a different view. So Washington Park. Um, Main features on this is to build a new entrance to Washington Park, uh, create bathrooms and a new shelter, repair some shelters and make some significant trail improvements. We have bid this project. Um, we actually bid this and the Old Town drainage improvements that William talked about earlier as the same bid package. Um, and we are taking that to council in February for approval. So we hope to see construction start in March.
We have several playgrounds. Um, they're also um, uh, currently being renovated. Uh, those locations are shown on the screen, Bolton, Lachlan, Skyland, Reynolds Park, uh, Rushy Fort Park, and um, the three uh, playgrounds there at Winston, Winston Lake Park. Um, and to give you an idea, here's the uh, proposed, the existing and proposed equipment for, for Bolton. Uh, as a note, uh, Bolton Playground was built using Parks and Recreation Trust Fund money as the quote unquote accessible playground for the city when it was built. Um, over the years, um, ADA guidelines have changed and have been updated and is no longer, longer uh, considered a, um, an accessible surface uh, for uh, persons with mobility impairments. Um, so we're looking to re replace that. Um, the surfacing will be a combination of poured in place rubber as well as engineered wood fiber with subsurface drainage. Uh, that project is under construction and is anticipated to be complete um, by the end of March. Um, Lachlan Park, uh, we're making some renovations to, uh, to Lachlan Park. Uh, there was a, a, some storm drain lines that run directly underneath the playground and through the park about seven or eight feet below grade. Uh, our stormwater uh, department came in and had to make repairs uh, to those pipes. Uh, as part of that, that work, we had to remove the existing swings there at Lachlan Park. And so we're looking, this project will replace those swings, uh, get those uh, swings placed back uh, on the site. And we're also gonna make some um, pedestrian walkway improvements uh, through the park that are wide enough for critical foot so that it's, it's easy to traverse from one end of the park down uh, through the other. Uh, that project is estimated to be complete in May of 21. Skyland Park, um, uh, the playground there is being renovated as well. Um, this particular playground, you can see the existing playground um, has old grown. This particular photo shows a lot of the grass um, in the park. That's because of the sand and silt that uh, had accumulated in the playground area over the years. This playground will be um, one of the playgrounds that we have throughout our park system that has actually a shade canopy over it uh, to protect users during some of the warmer months during the summer. Um, and this coupled with some improvements that we made to the basketball courts there at Skyland will provide a much better experience for people to use uh, to enjoy when they're out, out there at Skyland. Uh, again, this project is estimated to be complete in May of 21. Uh, this is the playground, which is um, if you're going, uh, or if you're on Reynolds Park Road, on the club, on the Reynolds Park Clubhouse side of the of the park, we have a picnic shelter, a large picnic shelter that gets used. This is the playground that's right adjacent to that. Um, we're going to be replacing that playground equipment. Uh, this project is under construction, uh, and there's a photograph of what the new playground equipment will look like in the lower right hand corner of the screen. And is the shelter just remaining as is? The shelter will, the shelter will, will remain as is. Uh, the shelter is in pretty good shape. Uh, it's a historic shelter. It's one of our older shelters. I want to say it's, it's on our, uh, it's historic in terms of um, uh, being on the register of deeds or anything like that, but it's one of our older shelters. It's kind of iconic and, and the shelter itself is in pretty good shape. Uh, this is Brushy Fork Park, um, which is located uh, just outside of downtown. Uh, the playground uh, there basically consisted of a couple of swings. Uh, we're replacing that. We're making some um, ADA improvements to, the, to this particular location as well. Uh, this playground is, um, we do have a contractor selected uh, for this particular location. Uh, and the estimated completion for this particular playground improvement um, is in June of this year. Uh, at Winston Lake uh, Park, uh, again, this is uh, shelter number one, which is near the Little League football fields, um, which is right across the street from Waterworks, um, Waterworks uh, Pool. Uh, this playground is very similar to the one at Bolton that was built with Partef money um, as an accessible playground. Uh, the playground equipment had long uh, outlived its, uh, its purpose and we're required to maintain these sites um, as for perpetuity for accessible uh, play opportunities. And so we're, the playground equipment there will be demolished. We'll be replacing it with uh, this new equipment that's shown here on the on the slide with subsurface drainage. It will be a much nicer playground for people to use when they choose to rent that particular shelter there at the park. Uh, shelter number three, 
um, if you continue down Winston Lake Road, uh, we have a total of, um, we have shelter, shelter number two, which doesn't have a playground, which Robert um, covered as part of his presentation. And then we have shelter number three and shelter number four. The images that you see here are for shelter number three. Um, this project has been bid. Uh, we do have a, a, a contractor selected. Uh, we're gonna be replacing the playground there, which really consists of two sets of swings with sand as a safety surfacing. Uh, we're gonna be replacing that with the equipment shown in the pictures below. The project is that project as well as once lake shelter number four are expected to be complete in June of 21. William, is there any crossover in the contractors from one location to the other? Are there any financial benefits to that type? Or, or is each one a different contractor? Um, many of the projects, uh, many of the projects are grouped. Uh, like the, the projects at Winston Lake are all being done by the same contractor. And so um, there is some cost benefit um, and we typically get better bids when they're bid together. Um, it's a lot less work and a lot, lot less time consuming. Um, Lachlan, Reynolds Park, and Skyland were all bid. Those are all a separate, uh, a separate contractor and, uh, and a different consultant that we had working on those particular designs. And so uh, they are coupled together when, when necessary to, um, uh, to make those processes a lot more efficient. Mm -hmm. Um, again, this is shelter number four. Um, there is a, uh, again, a sand, sanded area with just a set of, with a set of swings there. Uh, that equipment will be replaced with what's shown um, in the picture uh, here. And I believe this uh, safety service, I believe is a combination of engineered wood fiber and poured in place rubber. Um, and this project has been bid. We have a contractor selected the completion date for this one, as well as the other playgrounds there at Winston Lake are due to be complete in June of 21. Uh, this is uh, the Carl H. Russell Community Center renovation, um, which is located at Helen Nichols Park. Um, it's part of the renovations to the recreation center. Uh, it's gonna include gym renovations. Uh, it's gonna be an updated game room, uh, a computer room, uh, the outdoor patio area, which is shown in the existing picture now, is really, really an underutilized space. Uh, we're going to make some improvements to that area so that it, it could actually be rented. Uh, we're going to provide some uh, some shade structure and use it as a so that the, the residents in the community can use it as a gathering space. Um, in the pictures below, you see uh, there's there's actually a photograph so you can get an idea of what sport court looks like. Um, the gym there at Carl Russell has sport court in it. We're going to be replacing that. Uh, with hardwood floors, very similar to the ones that were shown earlier. Uh, we do not have a finalized design for that floor. We'll uh, generate one, share that with the council member of the ward. Once we get approval on that, move forward with that uh, with that design as well. Um, the project uh, is under construction um, and we're looking to have the, uh, uh, the floor and, it, and all the work completed by October of this year. William, wasn't there, uh, I may be mistaken, but wasn't there a kitchen renovation in the Russell Community Center also originally in the budget? Yes, there's, it's gonna include renovations to almost every, all the interior spaces there at the center, including the kitchen. Okay. Um, we use uh, a different funding source and we made improvements to the um, kitchen area at 14th, at Amelie Davis Recreation Center, which is at 14th Street Park. Uh, and so the renovations to the kitchen here at this location will follow that model uh, with, with new appliances, new countertops, um, and things of that nature. So um, the, the kitchen renovations here will be part of the renovations as well. Thank you. Okay, Haynes Park. Um, <clears throat> This, this project is, is really focusing on the, uh, the tennis center and the tennis courts, um, making some improvements to the, uh, the restrooms out there at the tennis center and um, redoing the surfaces um, at both sets of courts and then creating a new park entrance um, over on a, a underutilized area of the park itself. Um, 
design is pretty much done on this. The uh, the consultants were ready to submit to inspections for permitting, um, but the council member has asked that we hold um, one more public input meeting out there um, just to, to kind of show everybody what's what's going to be done in this project. Um, there There's a lot of interested parties in that area, so um, it, it's it's probably good to get out there and, and get everybody's uh, input before we start construction. Um, this is just kind of a, a site plan of the, uh, the areas we're looking at. The, uh, the yellow area is where the, the new park entrance we're talking about putting in. Um, we're going to be building walls um, that match the walls we've built um, around other areas of the park. Um, so everything will, will look very similar through there. Um, and then you can see where the, uh, the tennis center and the two sets of courts that we're going to be focusing on are in the, the purple and the blue. The renovations at our WR Anderson uh, Center were uh, to be gym renovations. One of the things that the council member wanted to do uh, was the was to be able to increase the capacity for spectators in the gym. Um, as part of this project, uh, the, the gym is going to get new painting. It's going to get new lighting. We're going to get new bleachers, a new hardwood floor, uh, and an approved ceiling. Uh, the budget for the project is five hundred thousand dollars. It's already under construction. This project came in under budget, um, and again, this gym floor was one of two uh, hardwood gym floors that we had throughout our park system. This gym floor had outlived its lifespan because um, one of the maintenance one of the maintenance tasks with the floors anywhere between eight to ten years. You come in and you do a, a light sanding on the floor and then re repaint and refinish the floor. Um, this floor has gone through that process several times. And so some of the exposed, some of the hardware that was used to keep the floor in place were beginning to become exposed. And so uh, this gym will get new floors, new backboards, new ramps, new scoreboard, there gonna be new lights. It's basically gonna be a brand new gym. Um, the es estimated completion for this project is uh, end of February of 2021. All right, and East on Park, um, <clears throat> it's ad adding a uh, pre-designed restroom building um, to the park. Uh, we have to run a uh, fairly significantly uh, long sewer line to be able to uh, install this. The design is complete on this. Currently, the uh, final estimate is over budget. Um, we are looking at ways to cut some costs in this. Um, also looking at some areas for uh, additional funding, but um, until we can get that um, estimate down under budget, we, we won't be bidding the project. And where is Easton Park? William, can you help on that one? Easton is, it's near, it's closer to the Bellevue um, area of the city. It's not far from Bellevue and Sprague. Um, I can't remember the actual name of the road um, okay. that's there, but it's on that side of the city. Um, what you're seeing here is ju just the, the plans for the, uh, the pre-engineered um, building. Um, it's the same kind of, I don't know if you've been out to uh, Miller Park. Uh, we did in the 2014 bonds, there was a new restroom built out there um, that was, we got from the same supplier. Uh, it's called Romtech. We're, we're real happy with the product. And so we decided to use, uh, use it at this park also. It's South Winston-Salem. So uh, just, just, just in looking at this, I mean, the building isn't fancy. So a lot of this cost is the sewer line? That, that is correct. The, the estimate for the building and the building installation is about $200,000. So the, the sewer line um, to get to the existing um, outfall is, is eating up the rest of that budget. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hobby Park improvements. Um, the original scope for some of the improvements at Hobby Park included the parking lot repair and resurfacing. 
uh, some landscaping and drainage improvements, and also improvements to our soapbox derby track that we here have there at Hobby Park. Um, many of you, I'm not sure if you, if if all of you or, or any of you have been to Hobby Park, but it's one of our special special locations where uh, people or hobbyists can take drones, airplanes, remote control helicopters, and there are spaces out there for people to use those devices in an open open environment, uh, open and safe environment. Uh, there's also a soapbox derby um, track there. And many, many years ago, we used to host the Nationals um, soapbox derby tournaments here in Winston-Salem at Hobby Park. Uh, that group has um, now moved to other locations, um, but they have told us um, that if we were able to make the improvements uh, to the soapbox derby, that they would be bringing that, that, um, that tournament back um, here to Winston-Salem. Um, that project is under construction. Uh, the majority of this project is complete. There's some final, uh, final minor details that uh, we're working with the contractor on in terms of picnic shelter uh, placements, some um, trash receptacle replacements, um, placements, and some final touches on the, uh, some punchless items on the parking lot design. But this project is under construction and we, our goal is to have this project complete by March of 21. So our final um, recreation bond order project is um, improvements to the strollway. Um, however, this is being managed by the Department of Transportation. Um, and so we decided to bump this project to our next meeting um, when we do our streets and sidewalks update, um, just so that we weren't bringing in more staff when they just have to come back next month. Um, so the final piece of project updates would be the stoplight report. Um, I'm gonna zoom in on this and just kind of scroll through it briefly and then um, kind of try and take questions, I guess, as we go, rather than reading to you every single thing on here, if that's okay with you guys. Um, if I can get my scrolling to work, here we go. Okay, so similar to what you've seen before, let me make sure we can see all of this, we cannot, okay. Um, so it's a little bit small. Um, most of our projects are in the green, particularly on the budget side. We do have a few schedule changes um, that we can go over on the explanation pages. Um, before we flip there, were there any questions about like project phase or budgets and spending that members had on this first page? Okay. And I'm gonna scroll down to our explanation section here. Um, so I tried to add in here how many months delayed, just so that you're not having to flip back. When did we say it was gonna be done versus when? what's the new projected timeline? Um, so fire station three, and um, a lot of these Robert and William touched on today, so hopefully we can go kind of quickly. Um, but fire station three is a little bit delayed. Um, as Robert mentioned, because of the, the design, the estimates from design looking like they were gonna be right on budget, um, we wanted to wait and see how Fire Station 13 came in to sort of verify that we weren't going to have to go through value engineering and things like that. So um, with that bid process now underway and we feel good about all of that, um, we're on track for a three-month delay on completion with that being done in August of 2022. Um, Bethania Rural Hall, um, and we ran into some COVID-19 delays. Our contractor um, had to quarantine, so we had to delay some of those pre-construction meetings and delay the construction process. Um, so that project is delayed two months and will be complete in August of 21. Um, whoop, sorry, scrolling too fast, let me get back. Okay. Um, lighting improvements um, is, just, is taking a little bit longer to get those installed. Um, that's facing a two month delay. Security improvements, um, we were trying to handle this in house, um, but the IS department has determined that an RFP for a contractor would be a better course of action, um, which just make the schedule take a little, need to get pushed out to allow for that RFP process and contracting. Um, we don't have an updated timeline yet. Um, we will get that as part of the RFP process and we can update you um, at a future meeting. Um, and again, when, when, when we talked about this earlier, we were seeing it was over budget in many cases, but we think we can get a contractor involved instead of city and still save enough money to be around uh, at budget. 
So like William said earlier, um, the three centers that are already complete are our three largest centers. Right. So they required a little bit more equipment and work than some of the smaller centers will. So staff is confident that um, because the, the remaining sites are smaller and require less equipment and that sort of thing that will come in under budget on a number of those. Yep. All right. um, the tennis court repairs, um, two of those are complete. Mineral Springs um, is now also complete, but it just finished a little bit behind schedule. Um, so that that's, um, but that project is now complete as William said earlier. Um, the indoor basketball court resurfacing, um, the current milestone is a little bit delayed because the first round of bids were unsuccessful, um, but the but staff believe that the whole project itself will remain on schedule. Um, Winston Lake phase two, um, it, it, this is actually kind of a good one. We saved money on this. Um, the mm -hmm. contractor was able to make a suggestion that saved us money, but as a result, uh, we had to go back and redo some of our contracting and stuff like that. Um, so saving money, but now a little bit behind on the schedule. Um, Salem Lake, our design firm had some professional changes that um, kind of set the project back a little bit, um, but they're on uh, working with Robert and keeping on track from here. Um, Haynes <laughs> Park, again, we had some personnel challenges at the design firm that set the project back about two months. Um, as Robert just mentioned, Easton Park is currently over budget. Um, and as a result, we're not able to move forward at this time until we either are able to value engineer something or find additional funding. Um, and so that timeline will be redefined once, the, once that has been resolved. Um, and as uh, William mentioned, Hobby Park work is still ongoing there. Um, there were some delays um, COVID-19 related delays for both the city staff and the contractor. Um, and so that project is about six months behind the published schedule. Um, so the remainder projects here are in streets and sidewalks. Um, and we'll get more specific project updates, but just sort of a, a quick overview of where we are. Um, concrete based street, resur street resurfacing um, ran into some additional um, impact with various utilities such as stormwater, um, water and sewer lines. And so design is taking a little bit longer as they work through those um, unanticipated um, impacts, but staff anticipate the project as a whole is on schedule. Um, Polo Road is currently delayed by about a, a month. Um, they were able to do the design of the original scope um, and the project cost was much lower than we had anticipated. So they're, um, they're working with the designer to add additional elements to the scope. Um, so if Gail, if Gail recalls from being on the, the bond committee for this one, there was a much, originally the Polo Road study resulted in a lot more pieces than what we committed to with the bond project um, due to cost concerns. And so they're just looking back at that study and then kind of putting some of those other pieces back in there. Um, Heather, could, could you very quickly just, what was in the original scope for the Polo Road project? Um, let me see if I can find the, um, the playbook here on my computer. <laughs> that that will be I don't know this one off the top of my head um, but let me find it really fast can you guys see the playbook yes okay so then all right let me try and navigate here to Okay, so they were looking at um, the area of Polo between Wake Drive and Long Drive. Um, they were gonna add medians in multiple locations as well as pedestrian signals at Polo Road and Rinalda Road. Um, and the city's portion of the funding was to focus specifically on um, traffic improvements and at one point, the discussion was that Wake Forest University was going to help fund some pedestrian improvements. I'm hoping when we have Tanique, our director of um, transportation here, she can talk a little bit more about how that's breaking down um, and exactly what they're adding um, 
And Heather, I, I can jump in real quick on okay. it just because I live over there near it. Um, if you guys have been down Rinalda Road where that uh, pedestrian crossing has been added with the flashing lights, um, Wake actually uh, paid for that facility. So that may be one of the items that, that helped with the funding. Yeah. Um, so, and I think some of what they're adding right now might be that any remaining funds section. Um, but I would need Tanique to give a little bit more specifics on that. Robert, so this is this is like when you come off the university there, they've added those dividers and in the road. Is that part of this project? I think that was done with an earlier project. Okay, okay. Uh, I can't say for sure. Okay. Yeah, they haven't, as far as the city's portion of the Polo Road improvements, we have not started any construction on this yet. It's okay. all in design. Yeah. Um, the business 40 quarter enhancements um, is currently delayed. Um, we're waiting for NCDOT to finish their final aspects of the Salem Parkway project. Um, that got kind of pushed back and delayed because of the financial challenges that state DOT is dealing with. Um, and we'll finish our final scope once um, scope and, and everything and timeline for the city's portion of those improvements once DOT's portion is complete. And Heather, on that and the next one, the multi-use path, mm -hmm. I, I understand that the DOT funds have been released again. Do we know if funds for these projects were included in some of the things that were recently released? I don't. So my understanding of the NCDOT financial challenges was that anything currently underway was being allowed to go forward. So Salem Parkway and all of its kind of associated things were being allowed to go forward, but they were maybe like delayed kind of as they were like moving things around. Um, but then things that had not been put under contract yet were stopped cold. Um, so that's sort of where they were. And they, they did kind of pause everything at one point and, and then sort of work on it in that way. So um, Tanique will be able to tell us more about that specifically, but I do know that they, they've been continuously working on Salem Parkway items. It's just maybe been a little bit slower than they had been going before. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, the multi-use path is again, joint with NCDOT. Um, this one's a little bit different than Salem Parkway because I don't think it was fully under contract yet. And so this one's a little bit more in a delayed holding pattern. Um, so we're, we are, I think we did just get some of the funding from the state though for that. Um, so we're working, we're working on those. Um, and then the last two, yeah, go ahead. I could just interject real quick too. And also there, there's some ongoing discussions between NCDOT, the city and Creative Corridors Coalition about the planned section of the multi-use path where it intersects with the strollway bridge uh, and how you know, uh, that section could be revisited in terms of uh, the impact on that area and 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 and, and ideas for a uh, park or a plaza there next to the uh, former U.S. Bankruptcy Court building that the city mm -hmm. now owns. So there's there's quite a bit more discussion that needs to take place there and potential potential uh, redesign depending on what comes out of those discussions. And what's kind of time frame you're looking at with that, Ben? I mean, is that a long, that's a long-term thing now? Uh, well, it could be. Um, I, th I think that the indication we've gotten from NCDOT that that uh, we might have to go back through a, the approval process if there is significant redesign to that particular uh, segment of the MUP. And so um, I think that's all kind of to be determined. The last two projects in the report um, are the Little Creek Greenway um, with projection completion date changing and utilizing contingency. Um, we had to realign the Greenway to avoid some conflicts with utilities. Um, and so the, the schedule is, is delayed by about three months. Um, and we also had to hire a design, a design consultant um, for this project rather than um, using internal staff. Um, which is what, which is where we use, where the contingency is coming in for that. Um, very similar update for Salem Creek Greenway. Um, we had planned to hire a designer for this, uh, but they were also the designer for Metal Arc Drive widening. Um, 
due to some challenge due to some challenges with metal arc um, they had to kind of refocus on that project um, which put them behind on this project um, and so we're delayed by about three months um, and design costs are also higher than estimated so we're using some of the contingency there so um, and then the final kind of update is the MWBE status report. Um, again, I don't, unless members want us to, I don't know that I want to read through all of this, but do folks have questions or we can kind of scroll through and ask as we go? I, just I, in reviewing them and again, kind of being new to this process, mm -hmm. the goals are aspirational. Um, hello, um, my name is Jakira Westbrook. I am the business inclusion manager. So no, the goals are not aspirational. So we do have goals and project specific goals for each project. And so when, as far as construction is related, when the bids come in, the contractors are expected to meet those goals. And if they don't meet um, the goals then they have to go through the good faith effort process to demonstrate their efforts in trying to meet those goals. Um, and depending upon if the contractor's um, good faith effort is deemed to be sufficient, um, then their goals will be the contractual goals for the project. And then I see where some of the times when it's not met, the, the organizations that have been awarded the contracts have affidavits. I mean, that's the process you just described. They just go through the process of saying we tried and we were able to accomplish this, but not everything. Correct. Um, affidavit C, uh, what you see here is listed in the stoplight report, is um, an affidavit that they submit when they have met the goals. Affidavit D is the affidavit that they submit when they did not meet the goals, um, referred to as a good faith effort process. Okay. So, Jakira, just overall, without any specific project in mind, is the challenge that we have, we don't have sufficient firms that are able to bid on some of these projects or is the challenge that there are firms but there's so much other work out there there that maybe they don't bid on the projects do you have any sense of that at all yes yeah, so i will say that covid19 has affected um the availability of mwbe firms and that mm -hmm. within this past year we have seen more good faith efforts than we did historically um, so yes, I think it's that we the work is still continuing, but the number of firms aren't available. Um, and so we do set goals based upon the number of available firms. And if we do see that contractors aren't able to meet those goals um, after you know several contractors have went through the good faith effort process, we do have the ability to reevaluate the goals that we did originally set, establish for the project. Okay. So is this confined to just Forsyth County, Winston-Salem, Forsyth County, or could these contractors reach out beyond? They could reach out beyond, but the firms that uh, contribute to the established goals that we set, they have to be hub certified by the state of North Carolina. Is there a list that is kept current, updated, or whatever of minority businesses? <clears throat> There is the state of North Carolina's hub data. They have a database um, for the different construction codes and professional services, as well as commodities and services. Um, and if you'd like, I will share that link with Heather so she can share it with you all. And on a scale of zero to 10, what is the, what is the track record in terms of zero being really bad? and 10 being um, satisfactory, I will say, in terms of making certain that these projects have the right mix. So there is several steps to ensure that. Um, the first is the, good, the goal setting process that we go through and evaluate the different aspects in the cost estimate to identify the number of available firms. Um, and then we have our good faith effort process, which our program is one of the more stringent programs within the state of North Carolina, whereas the state requires only 50 points for contractors to achieve to demonstrate a good faith effort, but our program requires 115. Um, so there's, there's things that we have in place that, that require contractors um, to demonstrate to us that they're actually going through the efforts to seek out the participation. When I reviewed it, the Bolton pool was the only one that stood out as like, oh, there was no participation. 
was, I mean, was that a, a kind of a misjudgment in the pre, in the in the understanding of how someone could participate that there just aren't pool renovation folks in, you know, I mean, I mean, that one kind of stood out to me is they didn't get any participation. Right. So for services, it's a little different from construction. So there are evaluation criteria um, that is established for the particular service with MWBE commitment being 20 percent and the location of business being also 20 percent. Um, and so with the construction being based on the lowest bidder and they're having to meet established goals, services, if a contractor or consultant intends to self-perform the project, they won't be awarded the point allocation for that particular criteria. And so depending upon the high, the highest scoring proposer is who will be recommended for award for that project. Based on my knowledge, this is this has typically been an area of what I would refer to as opportunity, that we, we really do have more and more opportunity or um, difficulty, if you want to say it differently, getting this kind of inclusivity. And given the, the COVID environment, it has made it worse um, for small businesses. And typically, you're talking about small minority businesses. You're not talking about the um, giants, if you will. Right. Yeah, and I, I agree that COVID has definitely affected the number of available firms that are participating, especially MWBEs on projects. Exactly, yeah. So Jakir, are we hearing from the MWBE firms anything specific um, about challenges that we might, that could possibly be addressed? Or is it, I'm, you know, I'm just looking at it sort of from the other angle of if, 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 if companies aren't getting participants or or subcontractors bidding, is there anything we can be doing on the other side to assist with these companies being able to bid on some of these projects? Right, as, as heard throughout the presentation, especially with the recreation projects, I think that the issue is the staff that the consultants um, or MWBE firms have. I think that they have lost some of their staff and so they're not able to participate on the number of projects that they were able to before or um, causing delays in the projects that they currently do have. Okay. So it's a capacity, is what you're saying is it's a capacity issue most likely? I think it, COVID it, it, is making it's some worse. of both. It's, it, it's some, I believe, financial as well, um, just funding too, but I think that the participation that we have seen previously, pre, pre-COVID, has been caused to COVID-related issues. Okay. Is there, is there any mechanism or, or consideration when there, when there just can't be NWBE participation for a project to be delayed? Um, so if a, as in the opportunities aren't available or those opportunities don't exist. Well, if, if the opportunities for MWD are temporarily dislocated, is it, are the projects continued despite the lack of participation or can the projects possibly be pushed out? I'm really just looking for whether there's, there's, there's a function for such a thing. I mean, we do have the apparatus of the good faith effort, which addresses that, um, but I would say that it depends on the urgency of the project and in, in my, and I can, Ben may be able to assist with this, but I just have never seen um, a project be delayed because of MWB participation because we have the good faith effort process. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I would say that once we go through our process and establish the goals, um, you know, when council awards the contract, if a particular you know, contractor uh, you know, demonstrated the good faith effort and, and, uh, to, and, and wasn't necessary. We weren't necessarily establishing the original goals for the project, but they're acceptable because they did demonstrate good faith and we probably will move forward with the project. Uh, you know, informally, we probably encourage those contractors to continue to seek opportunities, but, um, you know, only if council were to say, no, I don't think that, that, uh, there was enough effort done to try to uh, 
achieve a certain level of participation where we hold you know a project and then and keep it from moving forward and Ben, when you say council are you talking the council member for the geo where the project is held or the full council I'm talking about the full council i mean okay. i mean if yeah if, if we brought forward you know an item to, to recommend a award of a contract and uh, you know, and, and the and the the actual percentages that we're going to be committed to were less than the the initial goals. And you know, if the council said, said, "Well, I think that we could do more," and they could, they they as their prerogative, uh, you know, to say, you know, continue to, you know, maybe even rebid the project. And Jakar, definitely correct me if I'm wrong here. But uh, uh, but typically, once we've gone through this 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 process beforehand. And the goals are established, and good faith's been demonstrated. Then, then, then most likely the project's going to to move forward. Um, Thank you. So, has to your knowledge, has it has that ever happened? Yes, we've had projects where not necessarily at the council level, but when we before it gets to council for approval, when we see that. Um, the pro the goals were set too high based on the number of available firms. We have reset goals on projects. Okay. Thank you, Jakira. You're welcome. All right, so um, we have two more agenda items um, to kind of bring forward here. And the first is our COVID relief funding update, um, which Ben will provide. Yes, yeah, so um, just wanted to share with, with the, the committee that uh, you know back in April, May of last year that you all reviewed over 40 uh, applications to the city COVID-19 response fund. Um, you know, which we did in partnership with the uh, United Way and the Western Salem Foundation. Uh, and you all grant you all um, awarded uh, grants to 23 organizations. Uh, we entered into six month agreements with them. Uh, I would tell you that that most of them ha have uh, finished up <clears throat> their six month commitments, and so I'm in the process of compiling their final reports. Uh, to, to pre prepare a report to, to you all and to the mayor and council, but there are a handful of uh, organizations that still have not spent out all of their grant funds. Uh, so I have requested that they continue to provide monthly reports until they have spent out the funds. So, you know, while they've gone beyond the six month term, the formal six month term, uh, we still want them to report on, on the outcomes and the, and the, you know, the, the different demographic information of the clients that they serve so that we can report that to you all, uh, you know, when, when, when basically all, you know, 23 grants are, are spent out. Uh, I think it's in, in some cases in my conversations with the, uh, the contact people with those organizations, they just, uh, they're, they're, they're serving the community. They're, 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 they're awarding, you know, whether it's rental assistance or providing food assistance, uh, and it's just, uh, you know, they're, they're just uh, getting the, the, the funds spin out. It's just not getting spin out at, at quite, you know, at, at a rate that we would get it all spin out in six months. But, but, uh, but, they're, but they're still working towards utilizing those funds. And that's, that's right now the priority. As long as the funds are getting spent for the purposes for which the council originally awarded, the, uh, you know, appropriated the money, and as long as the agencies are demonstrating that they are, spending the funds and that they are you know, reaching uh, you know, the, the, the vulnerable populations that are the focus of this program, then um, you know, we're not looking to you know, take any kind of action or anything at that point. But, but, but once, once all the dollars are spent and I have all the final reports from those agencies, then I will uh, be bringing a report to you all to, to share what they've accomplished. And then Ben, will that be something like this stoplight report? I mean, it'll be pretty specific by group by organization. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I, my, my plan is to, to, to show you all, you know, the number of clients served you know, by each agency, uh, you know, probably a summary of overall clients served, and then by agency, the clients served, the type of assistance they provided, whether it was food assistance, rental assistance, or providing space for, you know, after school uh, programs or remote learning opportunities, because I know that you know of one uh, organization that's trying to do that. Uh, so, uh, so all the, all the different requirements that we, uh, asked the agency to report on, I'll be sharing that with you all. Thank you. 
Okay, um, and then our final item um, is from Patrice, and she's gonna talk to us about um, an additional charge for this committee related to social justice and anti-poverty funding. And I know the hour is late, so I'll go through this really quickly. Um, back in the fall, the uh, city count, mayor and city council appointed a community investments review committee uh, to discuss how to appropriate or how to uh, to recommend how to spend, let me give me this, a million dollars um, equity package. So council set aside an equity package of a million dollars. The charge was social justice and or anti-poverty initiatives. So the committee, which was made up of 18 members chaired by uh, Claudette Bailey and co-chaired by Kenneth Pettigrew. Uh, representatives were assigned by each ward. So two for each ward uh, was represented on the committee. They uh, looked at a number of resources, including the Poverty Thought Force um, and, and other city funded uh, resources related to social justice and poverty. Uh, they developed ideas, project categories, and then uh, created a scorecard to uh, vote and select, select different projects. What the committee ended up deciding is to not do specific projects, because as you can imagine, 18 people trying to come up with uh, projects on a on million dollars uh, was challenging. So what they decided on was five funding categories. So the categories are grants for social justice and anti-poverty initiatives at 200,000, uh, long-term anti-poverty social justice strategies at 200,000, broadband internet access expansion and training at 300,000, historic preservation and education at 190,000, and then mentorship and neighborhood capacity building at 110,000. So that totals up to the million dollars. And so the, Next phase was for um, this to go out to the community, to have the nonprofits be able to apply within these categories. What we also decided is that this broadband internet access category would be managed in-house by our IS department. So they're gonna take the lead on that. They will look at neighborhoods that don't have any access to the internet, particularly high speed internet access, they saw it as a, a way of life, um, like, you know, water, food and shelter, that this was really important. And uh, to be able to expand upon the city's existing infrastructure to build out access to uh, low income neighborhoods for that. The other categories, uh, we put out a request for proposals uh, recently, it was due about two weeks ago, and nonprofits applied for these funding categories. So this brings us to this committee. Uh, ben has just mentioned your great work on the COVID-19 relief. I'm, I'm building you up on this. <laughs> um, you all have done an amazing job with the COVID-19 relief uh, funding and, and allocations. And so, Initially, our community agency allocation committee was going to be the committee to review the applications. Uh, we do not have a full committee at this time. Many of the members rotated off and we need to get these applications reviewed and scored. And so um, we thought that CBOC would be an ideal committee because you all have the experience and have done a great job. And so we need your help to score these applications. Now, I want to warn you, we assumed it would be 30 to 40 applications, but we received 118 applications. <laughs> I see Melissa's mouth is open. <laughs> um, and so a, a lot of interest around uh, or, or, or agencies uh, thinking that they can address social, par uh, social justice and poverty. So um, I, I think this is a well-needed uh, issue. I think this is great. The council has earmarked a million dollars for this purpose. And so um, I will, we will meet with Gail and Mark this week, into this week to kind of discuss how we will approach um, 
the scoring and reviewing of these applications. And so, um, so we will appreciate your, your help and, and assistance on that. Now, this will require additional meetings outside of your normal CBOC, CBOC meetings. Um, so this will likely happen in February, if that's okay, okay with everyone. Can you share with the committee the information that was was sent out, what the criteria was to ask the nonprofits to apply? Mm -hmm. The, the part of what, what we, we can, you don't have to share it now. I mean, but okay. so we can, no, no, don't share it now. Uh, but so that we will know what was asked of them before. And I yeah. had, you said you have how many? 118. That's nothing compared to what we had for the small grant initiative of a million dollars. So I, okay. I, I'm pleased it's only 118. Great. That is fantastic to hear, Brenda. <laughs> um, okay. So, so I, I will just mention really quick, it was a very uh, broad request. It, it, all they were asked to do is, is to be able to address top poverty or some kind of social justice initiative in, in any form that they thought addressed one of those two, two categories. And then they selected a funding category where they thought they best fit, whether it was heritage preservation or just general kind of um, anti poverty initiative or mentorship. So, so they selected the categories and, and you will see the, the uh, I've divided it up by funding category. So, so we'll give you more information after I meet with the chair and vice chair of this committee um, to going forward on how, how they will be scored. And so it should be simple. I've set it up very similar to the COVID-19 for that reason. Um, so it'll probably be a score from one to four on those agencies. Um, so, so, so what is your timetable for dispersing funds? We would love to disperse the funds um, before the end of the fiscal year. So the fiscal year ends June 30th. So ideally April or May, because after you all make recommendations, then council will um, decide or vote on the recommendations. And then you have to do contracts for these agencies as well. So that takes a little bit of time, but before the end of the fiscal year will be ideal. So uh, I know this sounds like a lot of work and some of y'all worked on the other ones too, but um, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming it's mainly gonna be February looking at the applications and then scoring them and probably, I'm guessing probably two meetings to get through them all. We'll, we'll have to see how it goes, but I really hope everybody's willing to take this on because I hate to see a million dollars sitting somewhere when we've got so many agencies that could desperately use it. And uh, so, you know, when I first saw the number, I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> but we can do this. I have great confidence in this group. And, yeah. uh, and I think we can do it in a fairly um, streamlined process where there's an opportunity to discuss, but we don't have to spend, you know, half an hour on every one of these. Um, maybe we'll take a look at what scores in the highest groups and, and then see if anybody wants to pull any out from lower ones. I don't know. I haven't talked with Mark at all, but, you know, so that maybe we don't end up actually discussing a hundred and some of them, but we discuss the ones that we think have the most potential as a group so Gail I, I'm, I'm excited and happy to do it if you and Mark I'd ask you maybe just to consider two shorter meetings than the elongated version we had with COVID <laughs> I think sure. attention span attention span is an important I mean I, I just would like to think that everybody gets a fair look even if you're at the end of the meeting or the beginning mm -hmm. of the meeting okay that's a great point. And anything you, anybody has any suggestions or whatever, yell now or holler at me or Mark, um, you know, and we'll be happy to, I mean, we, we need y'all. <laughs> so well, we want to accommodate y'all. I assume you'll send it out for us to review before we have even a meeting. Yes. So now, that'll give us uh, as we the, did before. Okay, Ben, don't shoot me when I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I have asked Ben if, if, if it's possible for the staff to give us hard copies of that many proposals, just because for me, I like to sort them all out on my table. <laughs> so I don't know if 
other people will feel similarly, but with, as I, we were talking before the meeting started, my little printer can't print that many things. So that's something I had asked the staff if, if it was possible to do. Or if it's possible, I, if it's possible, I would enjoy, I, I, I would appreciate that as well. Well, or is there a way, maybe you don't need all of the facts, but maybe there's a way to consolidate in some graph, you know, a chart form, an right. Excel spreadsheet form, the critical information so that you don't have to cut a lot of trees and we don't have a lot of pieces of paper, but right. we've got the critical components right. there to look at. That would be that's currently better. they're in uh, an Excel sheet. You can yeah. see all of them by category. Um, you know, with Excel, the, the narrative pieces, you have to kind of look in that function area or do a, a wrap text, but it's all in Excel sheet currently. Uh, we can definitely send um, applications to the print shop. It's 507 pages. I've already looked. Oh. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, oh, no. so, yeah. I'm sorry, that's too many people. That's too many. I withdraw my request. That's too many. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> no, no, that's no. too many. No. Okay. Yeah. One it's, page per at most. Yeah, I think the staff needs to find, just give us what we need, not yeah. what we don't need. And we're currently working with IS on establishing like a, a website so that you can see it in its application form. But I think you'll find it easy to navigate through the Excel sheet. Uh, and that's the good, that's a good alternative if we've got an abbreviated format. And then if you want to go and look at the full right. sheet, but yes. that's a lot of, trust me, yeah. you don't want We don't to need five, that. no, we don't need five. I had no idea. <laughs> and, and after a while, you get tired of even reading all of this when you're going to pull out some critical points, you Absolutely. know, the organization and what they do and how long they've been doing and what they're going to do with this money and what's the... What, yes. And how are we going to monitor, or the city going to monitor? I mean, those are the critical things. What's the expected number population that they're going to serve? I mean, it's, you know, that's, that's abbreviating it. Yes. Right. Yeah. Well, we'll put it in your capable hands, Patrice. Okay. <laughs> Look, call if you need some more abbreviation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll make it simple as possible. And yeah. so, as, as Ron mentioned, trying to get through the meeting as fast as possible as well. So... So we'll do some and that makes work. a difference because we had over 200 with this small business thing. And I'm telling you, you just don't want to have that many people yeah. with lots yeah. of paper. I think I should, I just want to acknowledge um, council member Burke. I know she was listening in, but I always like to acknowledge the council member um, who's on, on the call as well as our, our city manager has, has come in. So I just wanted to, to acknowledge that. There's his picture. Hey. Lee, did you want to say something? There he Just, is. Just, uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate you guys uh, stepping up to the plate once again to help us with this uh, this review. I really appreciate it. So, and and of course you got the A team with Patrice and Ben. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Gail, back to you. Okay, well, uh, since we don't have, never did get a quorum, we cannot, we'll hold the minutes, approval of the minutes for the next meeting. And um, if there's no other business today, I would accept a motion to adjourn. Motion. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> All right. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.